in our hour here, we want to start with the high-profile corporate fraud trial in the case of Theranos founder Elizabeth Holmes uh, delivering four guilty verdicts in uh, what, the way that the jury weighed on that one. Three counts, criminal wire fraud and one count of conspiracy to commit wire fraud coming down yesterday. A stoic Holmes sitting there staring forward as the verdicts were read. Importantly, the jury uh, unanimously found her guilty of illegally fleecing investors out of millions of dollars through her company. However, the jury was deadlocked on three counts of wire fraud, and she was found not guilty on four counts of defrauding patients. And for more on that, I want to bring on uh, Jacob Frankel here, Dickinson Wright Securities Enforcement Practice Chair, who joins us. Uh, and Mr. Frankel, I mean, when we look at it, obviously, you we were just telling us, it's a little interesting to see kind of the, the attention paid to a private company. But of course, it's the highest profile, I think, ruling when it comes to uh, corporate fraud that we've seen in a long time. So what'd you make of the ruling? I think the, the jury's verdict was probably the best possible verdict for the government. And the reason I say that is because the conviction was on the fraud counts, the total well over $100 million, which really sets up the judge to impose a high sentence. By the jury being hung on certain charges and also returning a not guilty verdict on other charges, it really shows that the jury took the time and effort to distinguish between the charges. So while there's always you know, either side's hope for a unanimous ver verdict in favor of that side, I think a verdict like this actually really is the best possible verdict for the government. What kind of sentencing are we, are we talking about for Elizabeth Holmes? Every one of these charges carry with it about 20 years in jail. There's debates about whether, in fact, they could be served concurrently, whether it is 20, whether it could be, you know, closer to 60. I mean, what do you, what do you draw from this as we await the sentencing? Kiko, so that's great. That's a great question because we really never know what's in the judge's mind. But we also have a judge who's heard all of the evidence. The convictions are on the counts that under the, under the federal sentencing guidelines would suggest a maximum sentence would be imposed, typically in white collar cases. I mean, Bernie Madoff is the outlier exception. You know, we do not see sentences stacked upon each other, which is called, you know, running consecutive. So they're more likely to run concurrent on the, on the counts. But I could easily see the judge impose a double digit sentence here because we not only have the facts, the counts on which the jury returned a verdict of guilty, but also the message that the judge potentially will want to send in a case like this, because even though the charge was wire fraud, essentially what you have is securities fraud, defrauding investors in an amount that totaled well over $100 million and doing it in the context of a company that's not yet publicly traded. So I think there are nuances to this case that would weigh in favor of a judge opposing a fairly high sentence. Hey, it's a double digit, double digits years uh, to watch. Obviously, an appeals process could drag out. It could have a, a bit of a back and forth over, I guess, what the final amount of time served will be. But when it comes to, I guess, historical precedent, maybe Americans have out there for justice being served, maybe fears that some of it could get whittled down, particularly what we've seen, as you said, in the white collar criminal space. I mean, talk to me about how the appeals process you see going, uh, what could shape up there? Yeah, you know, the judge tried this case very carefully. I mean, t I mean, it's it's unlikely that an appeal would result in changing the sentence. And I think one of the unanswered questions is whether the judge is going to remand um, Elizabeth Holmes into custody, uh, you know, either pending sentencing or after imposing sentence, pending appeal, which is well within the discretion of the judge. The judge was very careful in trying this case. So it's not terribly likely we're going to see any reversible error. Certainly, Elizabeth Holmes's lawyer is going to be jumping up and down, arguing for the, you know, for the appeal and putting the best, their best foot forward. But the fact is, Elizabeth Holmes testified. That was a gambit. And ultimately, the jury made its decision in large part based on whether it did or did not believe Elizabeth Holmes. So I think the appeal is going to be, a, is going to be tough sledding for, for the defense. And I think we're likely... Um, to see a sentence, in, you know, a a real sentence imposed um, on her at you know at the end of the sentencing process. The other thing to keep in mind is that although she was acquitted on a number of counts and the jury was hung on a number of counts, the judge under the federal sentencing guidelines can consider all of the facts in imposing sentence. 
And I think there, there will also build in the element, not just of her having defrauded investors, but, but her conduct vis-a-vis -vis the patients as well. Jacob, there is an argument to be made here that what Elizabeth Holmes did, specifically with Theranos, isn't necessarily something that is unique, especially among these tech startups who are trying to raise a lot of money, sort of inflating the claims until the facts actually catch up to those claims. We heard from the DOJ several months ago saying they really want to, to crack down on white collar crimes. There were some policy changes that were announced back in November. How much of this you think could be a catalyst for tougher enforcement? I don't know about a, about a catalyst, but certainly a, a confidence builder. I think had the government lost, there would have been a lot of head scratching as to you know, the theory around building some of these cases. But I do think there really is, and you hit it on the head you know, with your introduction in, the, in that question, Akiko, in terms of a message to Silicon Valley, to startups, to companies that really do not fall within the, the active regular scrutiny of, for example, uh, the SEC. On the other hand, there is a focus on, in this, in this case, misleading investors, materially false and misleading statements that are being used for the purpose of inducing investors to invest. I think we've seen for a long time a lot of, say, whether it be lackadaisical, lack of care, inadequate diligence, when we're talking about you know, companies, that, whether they're the unicorns, privately held companies that are raising money that may not be subject to the same scrutiny, the fact is criminal laws apply, securities laws apply. And I do think you know, the, the US government will feel much, I don't wanna say more confident, but we'll, we'll have a sense of reassurance that bringing these cases, regardless of whether it's a high profile defendant or not, when there is fraud, and it involves misleading investors, inducing investors to invest, that it, we're going to see criminal prosecutions you know, in the coming weeks, months, and years. 